What's up guys? I thought today I'd do a video about kind of what I would consider a perfect fountain pen for myself. Um, you know, I, I feel like in a lot of the hobbies that I've been into, um, it, it usually goes into like two kind of separate groups of people who are either collectors or people who are just um, enthusiasts who are, you know, what's commonly known as, you know, the grail. Uh, you know, whether it be like the grail knife uh, in the knife world or like a grail pen in the fountain pen world. Um, and, not, you know, obviously not to say that collectors don't appreciate and use their pens uh, and that people who are just looking for like kind of like a grail pen won't necessarily accumulate a certain amount of fountain pens. Um, but those I feel like are the two major groups and I don't really find myself being a collector. Uh, you know, I don't really feel compelled to like get all the colors of Lamy Safaris or all the colors of, and different variants of like the Parker 51 or whatever. Um, for me, uh, fountain pens, you know, I don't have really any pens that are pristine and 100% new in box. All my pens basically have some use in them. And that's because, you know, in terms of practicality, I'm a user. And that's why for me, like, it, it, it's always a matter of trying to find the perfect pen like basically like the grail pen and it doesn't necessarily have to be expensive it doesn't necessarily have to be overly ornate or anything um but at the same time throughout this journey uh i have accumulated quite a few pens uh this is my pen case right here and i'm gonna basically kind of go through um a f you know a few of the pens that i own and just be like i i feel like i found my perfect pen kind of but at the same time most of the money that I've spent buying fountain pens have come after I bought what I consider my, my, um, like, grail pen. <laughs> so, it, it, it's kind of like a weird conundrum. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I, like I said, I'm not really a collector, but at the same time, I feel like as a fountain pen enthusiast, there's certain pens that I want to kind of own just because, uh, and, you know, I've already accumulated some of them. Um, so we'll go into this case. Uh, these are basically kind of like the pens I'm mainly going to focus on. I have some, uh, you know, less expensive pens over here. Um, this isn't all my pens. This just happens to be what's here. I have like two pens up here uh, that I'll talk about later. <clears throat> but for me, what I consider my, like, grail pen has basically been the Pelican M600 uh, or the 600 series in general. Um, you know, for me, I find, like, this pen is... It's very light, so it's very comfortable with write, to write with for extended periods of time. Uh, it's a very good size. You know, I, I think it's a, for the general person, average person, it's a good size. It's not overly large uh, or heavy, and it's not overly small and thin either. Um, you know, the nib is easy to swap out if you don't want to necessarily have... It's actually kind of funny because I say it's my grail. Oh, shoot! <laughs> Whoops! It's okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Very nice. Um, I say it's my grail pen and I just drop it on my floor. Uh, fortunately, I didn't drop it on the nib, so it's okay. Uh, it kind of, I kind of made sure it landed on its side. Uh, and it's actually not inked up right now, uh, just because I, I have two other pens that I'm currently using. And, um, so, you know, I, I don't want to... I don't like to keep several pens inked up all at once. Uh, but this is kind of my grail pen just because the nibs are easily interchangeable, it's relatively relatively easy to maintain, it's lightweight, it's a good size, you know, it's very comfortable with, to write with for extended periods of time. Um, since then, I have spent a decent amount of money on pens after the fact. Uh, before I had actually bought this pen, this isn't, you know, this was one of the most expensive pens I had bought uh, at that time, uh, be but beforehand, it's not like I was a complete stranger to, like higher end pens, you know, like you see here, I have like some Lamy Safaris and stuff. Uh, but previous to the Pelican M600, I had bought um, this Lamy 2000, which was like one of my first like $100 plus fountain pens. Uh, and I had also bought this Pilot Custom 74 here. Um, but I'm not going to really go into those uh, just because those do end up you know, I did end up getting those before I had gotten this pen. I'm going to kind of basically go over the negatives of certain pens that I've gotten after I bought them 600 uh, and why they don't, why they aren't like my ideal everyday carry pen. Uh, I guess I'll try and go in order. 
Uh, I have a Pelican M650. Um, this was kind of a splurge buy. This is the most expensive pen I currently own uh, in terms of what I paid for it. Um, and the same thing applies basically with the M600. Uh, other than the fact that this has a um, sterling silver cap, you know, that's plated in gold. Um, but, you know, the body of the pen itself, it's still the same, you know, interchangeable nibs, light, uh, it's lightweight and all of that. Uh, sometimes I will actually swap out this body for the black cap. Uh, so it's essentially, you know, it, it, it's essentially if I had a, a M600 normal without the, uh, the 650 cap, uh, except this has an 18k nib on it. Um, the reason why I don't carry this every day, uh, just because, you know, I really like the gold cap. Uh, it, it is gold plated, not gold filled, so I'd rather not really wear away at the plating too much. So this is kind of like a dress, like a dressier special occasion pen. Uh, but other than that, you know, it, it, it's basically in the same lines as the standard M600. Uh, I don't write with my pens posted for the most part, so uh, the heavier cap with the sterling silver, not that big of a deal. Um, afterwards, I have also gotten. A Mont Blanc 146. Uh, this is a variant from the 80s. And this is a pretty nice pen as well. Um, it's a little heavier because it does have like a brass piston. Um, what's it called? It, it does have a brass piston assembly in the back. Uh, it is slightly larger than the M600. You know, you can see it's just, just a little bit longer. Um, and it's a little bit thicker at the section. It's also very comfortable to use. Uh, it is a little back heavy. Uh, for my likes and taste. Um, I used to write at an angle like this. Uh, since I've moved to an angle writing like this, the back heavier pens aren't as big of a deal as they were before, so it's not terrible. Uh, the only thing I don't like about this pen, really, uh, is the nib size is a little too large. It's more towards like a medium uh, and than, a, than a fine, and you know, my handwriting is not the largest in the world, uh, and especially when, when you write with cheaper quality paper that's more absorbent, the line just kind of just spreads out a bit. Uh, so this is a little too broad for me to write with daily, which is why I don't. Um, obviously I could always get it sent out and have it ground down, or I could do it myself, um, but that's besides the issue. Another point I don't like about this pen in particular is it's kind of difficult to maintain. Uh, now, you know, Montblanc has a proprietary tool that they won't obviously sell to you. Uh, you have to send it in for service to either remove the nib or the piston assembly. Uh, I have done a video in the past taking apart this pen, so it's not like I can't do it, but it's more of a hassle um, because every time I take apart the piston assembly, I always feel like I'm going to risk breaking something, you know, especially the uh, the worm screw that's connected to the, the piston end cap. Uh, I feel like it's going to break, and once that breaks, I have to send it in for repair, and it's gonna cost a good chunk of change uh, versus with the M600 I could just easily unscrew the nib uh, granted when I unscrew the nib I will screw up the uh, timeline a little bit but for me I can always correct that uh, and the reason why I want to be able to either unscrew the piston or the nib easily is to basically re-grease the piston um, I tend to use a lot of Noodler's bulletproof inks uh, and for anyone who uses bulletproof inks you know that it kind of wears away at the whatever silicone grease or lubrication you have in the piston assembly uh, and it tends to make it kind of tight. Um, you know, when I first got this pen, I started filling it up with uh, 54th Massachusetts and I used it for about four months, uh, non-stop, you know, I, I used it every day, um, but I never really took it apart to maintain it. And one day when I was like trying to draw uh, the push the piston down to draw up ink, it felt really tight. I was like, oh crap, I, I gotta grease it up at this point. Uh, so it's nice that with this, I don't have to necessarily send it out to anyone to get the work done. And it's very easy to do, unlike with the 146. <clears throat> uh, I had also gotten this, a Parker 51 uh, from this crap. I think it's from like the late 40s, like early 50s. Uh, it's a Aerometric. Um, this is a pretty solid pen, and you know, for a lot of people on the forums, y you kind of know that if you get a Parker 51, they're pretty much very durable, good everyday use pens. Um, this one happens to have a gold filled cap. Uh, they're lightweight, uh, and if, especially if you get the Aerometric filler versus the Vacumatic, uh, they're very low maintenance. You know, this is probably still the original. Um, 
sack in here and stuff from the 50s and it works just fine there's a little bit of staining in there but it's not like it has any issues with uh you know not drawing up ink or anything and flow is very good um the only reason why i don't use this like i said is um this nib is leaning more towards like the medium uh medium broad uh and like with the 140 uh 146 it's not a nib that i could use on an everyday basis also i find that with hooded nibs um, I have some difficulty keeping the pen writing on the sweet spot, uh, just because, you know, with a hooded nib, it's not so easy to see the tine alignment in terms of being perpendicular with the surface that you're writing on. Uh, so, you know, for me, as I write naturally, I will twist my wrist a little bit, uh, and it'll get off the sweet spot, and it'll start getting, like, scratchy and stuff. So, you know, that's kind of the same reason why, like, the Lamy 2000, even though it's a really nice pen, it has a really great hand feel, uh, because it's kind of like a hooded nib, and it's hard to keep everything perpendicular, at least for me, with the writing surface. I don't use that as an everyday pen. Um, I do want to get this ground down. Uh, <laughs> my friend, I, I feel like, you know, one of my friends, he, he would basically kind of disown me if I ever ground this down, uh, just because, you know, Parker 51s, it is more rare to find a pen with a broader nib than it is to find a fine nib which is what he told me but when i went looking for fine nib parker 51s i couldn't find any so you know <laughs> it's kind of like the same thing with the 146 uh but whatever that's another story uh. and also the gold cap is a little flashy it's kind of my fault because i i kind of wanted the gold cap when i saw it you know i, I could have easily gotten like a lustroy cap or some something but um I happen to get this at a very good price, so I'm not complaining. Uh, the Parker 51 is basically one of those pens that I feel is like a pen that me as a fountain pen enthusiast should own because it is very popular. It's very famous. Uh, so I felt like I needed to add one to my collection, I guess. Uh, but you won't see me going around looking for different Parker 51s. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with this. Uh, whether I get the nib ground down or not, I don't know, uh, but I'll always have some use for it, you know, probably at least like a, as a showpiece in my collection. Uh, I also got this Edison Collier, which was one of my first like really big pens, uh, and I, I felt like it would work out really well. Um, unfortunately, there are a few issues. Uh, one is that it takes quite a few turns to actually uncap the pen. Uh, so for me, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not like a very heavy endurance writer in the sense that you know i don't sit down and just write for and you know hours on end uh, what i do is i sit down i write something you know i fill out data sheets most of the time i cap the pen and then i uncap it and write some more uh so this is kind of a pain another problem i had with this pen was that uh i felt like this section here it pinched in a little too much uh and it's just not comfortable for me to hold um you know it's a big pen and all, and big pens are supposed to be relatively comfortable to hold, but when the section is that tiny, it doesn't really matter how big the rest of the body is. Um, <clears throat> I had thought about getting a custom section made from Edison, uh, but the price that uh, it, it would have gone for, I didn't feel it was worth it, and I actually ended up putting um, that money towards actually getting a Sean Newton Custom, which is on order, which I hope will, you know, it's going to be a long six, seven month wait, but hopefully it'll be worth it. So, yeah, I'll be doing a video of that pen, which I kind of hope that pen, because it's a custom and it's made to the specifications that I want, will become like the perfect pen that I, I can be happy with for writing for long periods of time. But we'll see what happens when I actually get that pen. Uh, I had also gotten, uh, I, I got this Waterman. Uh, this was more like same in the same boat as the Parker 51. I didn't get this for everyday writing. I got this purely because I wanted a vintage like fl wet noodle flex pen uh there are some people who say this may not be constituted as a wet noodle but i feel it's very soft and it writes very broad from very fine lines so you know whatever uh i had also gotten this pen here i actually have two of these uh these are schaefer balances uh from the 90s uh, so i guess you'd call it the balance two and these are very nice pens uh these are these pens are very similar to the M600 in size, as you can see, cap, uh, the Schaefer balance is a little, little longer, but because of the tapered ends, if you actually just compare the, the bodies of the pens, you see here, they're very similar in length. Um, it's made out of acrylic, uh, not like celluloid, like from the, uh, the old vintage ones or anything. Um, and inside is, I think, a brass sleeve or some kind of metal sleeve, so it gives it some weight, so it's not overly light. And it's a very well-balanced pen, you know, much to 
<laughs> its moniker. Like it, it's a very well balanced pen. You don't have to post it. Uh, I highly recommend you don't post these pens, the vintage or this '90s era one, because uh, a lot of people who tend to post it, they find that they uh, crack the cap lip around here. So it is balanced enough and it is large enough of a pen and comfortable enough for, to hold, at least from my hand size, that I don't feel the need to post. Um, one of the reasons why I don't carry these pens on a regular basis, which is kind of a lie because this pen I've actually been carrying, um, it's why it's inked up with uh, another pen uh, that it's been in my pen case. I've been using this on a daily basis, but this pen has the reputation of being very fragile. Um, not so much the solid color balances from the 90s, but you know these two, uh, the Aspen, the Amber, um, all of the flake style acrylics, because the material is so thin uh, and because of how this flake um, design is made, which by the way is very gorgeous and I am still on the lookout for a jade version as well as the Aspen and Amber, uh, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, but because of that, the thin walls and the uh, fragile material, um, these pens are known for cracking, to get, easily get hairline cracks. Uh, like I said, if you post these pens, you get cracks on the, um, on the cap lip. Uh, also here where the clip is mounted, if you uh, pull up on this clip a little too much, uh, you can crack the material here. Uh, I had actually found um, a Schaefer Balance 2 in jade green in the rollerball for a really good price. And you know, you can actually take a rollerball, you can gut it out, put the uh, Schaefer nibs nib and nib unit and section in here and it'll basically be like the fountain pen uh but at a much lower price but when the seller was getting ready to ship the pen out to me uh he actually found that there was actually a crack in the barrel and he you know he basically explained it to me um and he said that he was going to send it to uh Schaefer um to have them look at it um but I already know in my heart that they don't have parts for this pen anymore. You know, back in like the 90s, maybe early 2000s, they probably still had parts to replace the cracked barrels and caps and whatnot, uh, but they don't have those parts anymore, especially in Jade Green, which, you know, apparently was one of the more rare colors, color variants of this pen. Uh, so, I unfortunately, that, that transaction had to get canceled. I got my money back, but I was very disappointed because I really wanted that pen. Um, but that's why I don't really carry them. Uh, this I actually found that, uh, you know, I got these both of these pens used from a friend. Uh, and if this will focus, it's not going to focus. Uh, there's actually a chip out on the bottom of here. So that's why I started using this. Uh, this, this Crimson Glow one is actually still in pretty new condition. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that it's brand new because I don't have a box for it. Um, obviously, I'm pretty sure my friend had used it. But, you know, I couldn't detect any cracks. There are no chips out of it or anything. It looks amazing. This would be a great, like going out for Valentine's Day pen, if I actually had a date for Valentine's Day, but whatever. <laughs> um, I, I don't mind the, uh, the, the the cobalt looks really nice too, and this natural lighting with the sunlight, it looks really good, uh, but under artificial lighting, um, this definitely stands out a lot more than this, even though in this natural lighting, they both look amazing. Uh, originally, I didn't even want these, like, like these pens. I had no thoughts about getting them. I know the balance is like an iconic pen design. It just never really did anything for me. Uh, but after I bought them and I saw the material, uh, these are the pens that kind of, along with the Collier, kind of got me into acrylics and less into like boring plastics and whatnot. Uh, although that custom pen I got, I could have gotten in a nice acrylic, uh, but I ended up just getting in plain polished black ebonite. Um, but I'm not going to ruin anything until I actually get that pen. Uh, at the same time, I, I had also helped my friend move, so he gave me this Waterman Charleston, which is also very nice. Um, the reason why I don't use this, uh, the medium nib, uh, I can make it write a little drier and it's okay. I can write, use it on poor paper and it, it has good hand feel. Uh, it's a, like there's also brass leave in there to weigh it down a little bit. I just don't like the yellow color. It, it's just, it stands out a little too much for me. Um, you know, even I feel like the yellow stands out more than this, uh, this cobalt blue. And finally, one of the last pens that I gotten recently, I bought myself for Christmas was this, uh, Visconti Homo Sapiens MIDI sized. Uh, this is probably my second most expensive pen, um, you know, after the 650. And it's a nice pen, it has a, it's a unique material, it's very grippy, but it's hard, you know. I, I'll go more in depth into it um, in the video that I do for this pen. Um, but one of the reasons why it wasn't a really great EDC pen for me, or like a grail pen, um, was the nib. 
Uh, Visconti's Dream Touch nib uses Palladium, which is kind of soft, but not like a flex nib soft. And it just wrote too wet. Like, and even on good paper, it wrote really wet. Uh, I have since actually changed out the nib to a steel nib, which I'll go into more details about in the video for this. Uh, and now it writes nice and dry. It writes really well, and that's why it's been my everyday carry uh, since I got it back from Coles of London uh, for warranty repair, which I will also get to some other time. And that's basically the pens that I've gotten since the M650. Like I said, like mo my most expensive pens I've gotten after I've gotten this pen. And, you know, the price obviously wasn't the main dictator of what I would consider my Grail pen. Obviously, I have other pens on the list that I would want to get. Uh, you know, I have a Nakaya on my wish list. Uh, the Pilot Custom 823 is also on my wish list. I'd love to get my hands on a 149. Um, I've handled it and it writes really well. And actually, the custom pen that I got is based kind of around the 149's dimensions. Uh, but I, I would still want to own a 149 just because it would match well with like the 146 in terms of an iconic pen. Uh, and I don't know, I guess for like the last five minutes of this video, I'm going to discuss what I find is most important about things that I look for in an ideal fountain pen. And it's probably something I should have gone over in the beginning of this video instead of at the end. It's because it's more of like a philosophy thing. Um, obviously people who didn't want to go through 20 minutes of me showing off my pens uh, won't see this. But oh well, if you're still here, then you'll kind of get to learn something from it. There are three main things that I'd like to consider when I look at a pen. One is how the nib writes, two is how the pen feels, and three is the overall aesthetics of the pen. Uh, some people like very flashy pens, and that's fine. Um, you know, like the the limited edition Mont Blancs, they look gorgeous. And they're very expensive, but they look great. Um, a lot of, and uh, you know, f myself included, you know, for me, aesthetics is almost the last thing. Like, you see, I like very boring pens. I like, like, plain black and gold trim pens, or even if this was the 605 with uh, silver trim, it would be really nice. I don't like super flashy pens. Uh, even, you know, something like this with the 650 or the uh, gold filled cap in the Parker 51, that's a little too flashy for me for an everyday basis. Um... What I used to consider most important was the nib, uh, and I feel like that's what a lot of people would say in terms of what they would look for first in a fountain pen. But what I've discovered over the years, not, oh my god, over the years, over the months that I've really gotten into this hobby, is that nibs don't really c come that great from the factory. Uh, now obviously some of my earlier on videos, like on the Lamy 2000, my standards have gotten higher as I've gone gain more knowledge from found pens. You know, like, when I first started writing with Lamy Safaris, I felt they wrote really well and they were super smooth. Now going back, they don't write that well anymore. Uh, and that's just because I found something better. Unfortunately, you have to pay the price for it. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to buy an expensive pen to get a really nice writing nib, uh, but you have to, like, all of these nibs have been tuned by my hands uh, under a loop. Um, that's kind of the price of admission. Like, you have to get a nib properly tuned because factory tuned nibs nowadays are not that great and maybe that's why it's good to buy a pen from a nib meister who will take a look at the pen uh, before they ship it out to you because that's where the nib performance really is and that's why I feel like it shouldn't be the first thing that you look at in terms of what you're looking for in an ideal pen because the nib can always change you can always modify the nib or get it modified however you want to whatever amount of feedback you want whatever grind you want uh, to a extent, obviously, if you get like a extra fine nib, you're not going to be able to turn it into a broad nib unless you get it retipped. But you can always get that pen in like a broad size and bring it down, or get it cut to a italic or an oblique, or you know whatever you want a stub. Um, so that only leaves the second point, which is like design and hand feel, and that's why I feel it's most important. Um, this pen has good hand feel, it has good dimensions, it has good weight, you know, it's very balanced, it's not back heavy like the 800 or the 1000 series. At the same time, it's not so narrow like the 200 or 400 series where it makes it cr cramp your hands a little bit to write with for extended periods of time. So that's, that's what makes it an ideal pen. Um, you know, I could get this pen, it could have the worst nib in the world. I can always get the nib swapped out. I have swapped out this gold nib to an M200 medium stub that I ground myself and that's probably my favorite nib over this 14 karat nib and that's only a $30 nib unit plus the labor and effort it took for me to grind it and polish it down. Um, like I said, if you get a pen from a nibmeister, 
you can get them to tune the pen for you before they ship it out to you, and you'll save money that way because usually it'll be like a service that they offer for free uh, to a certain extent, you know, tuning and stuff. They'll do for free grinds you'll have to pay for, but still, it saves you from getting a pen that may have a great nib, but you won't feel comfortable with writing. You know, a lot of people, they like the Pilot Vanishing Point. I've written with it. Short periods of time, I had no problems. I really feel like I wouldn't be able to write with that pen for a long period of time. And a lot of people who are looking towards the second, their second pen and they want a gold nib pen, a lot of people recommend the Vanishing Point. And it's just, it doesn't work out that way. Granted, Pilot Nibs generally write very well, but then you're stuck with that weird body and the clip placement and you may not find that comfortable versus you as a person can just go out, buy a pen regardless of the nib and then get it tuned at later for an additional 20 to $30. But then you'll have the perfect pen for you because it fits your hand well and you can make it write better after the fact. Uh, and then aesthetics is a whole different thing where you know you can decide what you like in a pen and how it looks. Uh, you know, that was one of the big draws about the Homo Sapiens. It was a cool pen. I didn't really care all that much about the Palladium nib. What I really cared about was the body because you always hear people talking about the Homo Sapiens, how it has like a nice grippy texture, it has great hand feel, and it's true. And as soon as I got to handle uh, a full-size Bronze Age at um, Fountain Pen Expo, I knew I had to get one of these pens. Uh, granted, I ended up getting the midi size uh, because, you know, it falls more in line with uh, like the M600 line, which I prefer in my size range. But I just knew as soon as I felt it, I want this pen. But then I had no problem switching out the nib to a cheaper steel nib because I didn't like how the Palladium nib wrote. So, you know, th that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I hope you guys kind of found this video a little bit informative. Uh, it's less about me showing off what I have. Uh, obviously, most of the pen these pens have been in videos already. Uh, it's just more about me kind of going through my thought process about the pens that I've bought and what I consider when I'm looking for a good writing pen. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video and thanks for